Hi, and welcome to our video on DNA replication. In their 1953 paper, in which they described the double helix model of DNA structure, Watson and Crick were already aware that the structure of the molecule really helped to explain how it was copied from generation to generation. And it's that process, which we call replication, that we're going to talk about in this video. Just as a reminder, DNA serves two roles in the cell. DNA is the molecule that's passed from generation to generation, and that's DNA replication. And then the information in DNA is used to direct the production of proteins by the cell. But we're going to focus on the first one today, DNA replication. In this video, we're going to learn about the experimental evidence that supports our understanding of replication. And then we're going to look at an overview of the process and how it's accomplished inside of cells. The major experimental work that we're going to look at focuses on the determination of how DNA is copied, what we call semi-conservative replication. Looking at a DNA molecule, it seems obvious that this is how DNA could be copied, but there are other possible ways that DNA could possibly be replicated. Here are the three major models. In the semi-conservative model, each strand of the original DNA molecule serves as the template for the production of an entirely new, brand new strand. So each molecule that's made is made out of one totally new strand and one of the old pre-existing strands. In a conservative model, the existing DNA molecule serves as a template for the production of an entirely new DNA molecule. So at the end of replication, you have one DNA molecule that's made out of the two original strands and the other that's made out of two brand new strands. And then in the dispersive model, each of the original strands serves to replicate portions of each of the two new molecules. So at the end, the strands of both of the new molecules are combinations of old DNA and new DNA. Again, looking at these models, it's already pretty obvious that semi-conservative replication is the way that it should work, but science doesn't work on shoulds. Science works on proof. And it's the work of Mieselson and Stahl that conclusively demonstrated that the semi-conservative model of DNA replication was in fact the way that replication occurs. What Mieselson and Stahl did was to grow E. coli bacteria in a media that contained an isotope of nitrogen with an additional neutron, which we'll call heavy nitrogen, which has one additional neutron compared to the most common isotope of nitrogen, or nitrogen-14. After they'd grown this bacteria long enough, all of the DNA and all of the bacteria in the culture had incorporated this heavy nitrogen. What they then did was transfer the culture to a media that contained regular, or what we'll call here light, nitrogen-14 media. They then interrupted the process of replication after every generation, which for bacteria is only every 20 minutes, and they were able to use density centrifugation in order to look at the amounts of nitrogen-14 and nitrogen-15 that the bacteria had incorporated into their DNA. In the first generation, all of the bacteria still had that heavy nitrogen-15 in their DNA. And so when they centrifuged this, you could see that the DNA was 100% towards the heavier end of the spectrum. And they noticed that after the first replication event, all the DNA was now of an intermediate density between a band that would be expected if the DNA only contained light nitrogen and a band that would be expected if the DNA contained only heavy nitrogen. The density band that represented DNA that contained only heavy nitrogen has totally disappeared. That experimental result refutes the conservative model of DNA replication. Over successive generations, they begin to see bands of DNA comprised entirely of light nitrogen, and they see that intermediate band decreasing in amount. It's the presence of this band of DNA comprised only of light nitrogen that supports the semi-conservative model of replication and refutes the dispersive model. If every DNA strand was made out of combinations of light nitrogen-containing nucleotides and heavy nitrogen-containing nucleotides, then you would never see a band that was entirely made out of only light nitrogen-containing nucleotides, which we begin to see in generation three and going forward. This was the experimental result that demonstrated that not only was the semi-conservative model the obvious model for DNA replication, it was also the accurate one. The second segment of this video is going to look at the details of the DNA replication process. And we're going to begin with where we need to begin, which is where does replication start? It turns out that replication begins in cells at what are called origin sequences and then proceeds bi-directionally from that origin sequence. This leads to the production of a structure known as a replication bubble, and I'm sure it's probably visually obvious how it got this name. Looking at either end of the replication bubble, we get to what we call the replisome, or all of the enzymes that are functioning together to enable the process of DNA replication. We're not going to go through all of them, we're only going to go through the major ones, and I'll spotlight each one as we go through it. Helicase is the enzyme that's responsible for actually opening the double helix structure to allow the rest of the replication machinery to get access 
to the DNA. In front of helicase, we have a molecule called topoisomerase that is constantly rotating the DNA molecule so that you don't get a buildup in tension. If you pull on the two ends of a helix without doing something down below to release that tension, usually by rotating the helix in the opposite direction from the direction it's being pulled apart, tension will build up. And this tension is actually so great in DNA that it could cause the phosphodiester bonds that hold the nucleotides on each strand together to break apart and shatter the DNA molecule. We don't want that to happen and it's topoisomerase his job to prevent that from happening. Due to reasons that we'll discuss in short order, there are occasions where you won't form phosphodiester bonds between the nucleotides on the same strand. The enzyme that takes care of plugging these gaps in a strand is known as DNA ligase. To ligate something together is just a fancy way of saying to connect it. The enzyme that's responsible for actually synthesizing the new DNA strand using the code of the pre-existing strand is known as DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase works by taking free-floating nucleotides, or as they're called, nucleoside triphosphates, and incorporating them into the new strand according to the sequence of the pre-existing strand. This is an autocatalytic process. The energy to form the phosphodiester bond between a new nucleotide and the ones that already exist in the strand comes from breaking off the terminal two phosphates on the incoming nucleotide, which is an exergonic process that produces the energy necessary to build that phosphodiester bond. However, this only works if you make a nucleic acid strand in a specific direction, the five prime to three prime direction. Let's talk about what that means. DNA molecules are arranged in an anti-parallel rotation. What this means is that one is functionally upside down compared to the other, and you can see that in this graphic. Now, of course, upside down doesn't really matter in the subatomic world, so we have to use descriptors from chemistry to describe this orientation. We say that one strand is in a five prime to three prime direction. This refers to the functional groups that are attached to the different carbons in the deoxyribose sugar that makes up a DNA nucleotide. The phosphate groups are attached to the five prime carbon, and there's a hydroxyl or an OH group on the three prime carbon. In a DNA molecule, one strand will be arranged five prime to three prime, which we can see in this direction, and the other strand will be arranged in the opposing or three prime to five prime direction. Keeping that in mind, it might not be apparent how double-stranded DNA replication is possible. What I've done in this cartoon is put all of the enzymes of the replisome together in this big orange blob here at the replication fork. We see the two different strands of a DNA molecule that are being separated for replication. The top strand runs from the left to the right from five prime to three prime, and the bottom strand runs in the three prime to five prime direction. The direction that the replisome is moving is towards our left. It's no big deal for the replisome to make the top strand of the DNA molecule. New strands have to be made in a five prime to three prime orientation in order for that autocatalytic process to happen, but that's going in the same direction as the replisome. This strand is what we would call the leading strand, and we say that it's made continuously or in one big piece. The issue is the synthesis of the new strand at the bottom of the picture. It also needs to be made in the five prime to three prime orientation, but but five prime and three prime are pointing in the exact opposite direction of the way that the replisome is moving. The solution that cells use to solve this is to make that bottom strand or lagging strand discontinuously or to make it in segments. These segments are referred to as Akazaki fragments. As the replisome moves down the molecule, it can only catalyze the synthesis of a comparatively small piece of the lagging strand, at which point it needs to stop synthesizing its current fragment and begin synthesizing the next one. The result of this is a lagging strand that is made in segments. If we go back to our cartoon graphic of the replication fork, we can see the synthesis of the two different strands here by the replisome. The leading strand is being made at the bottom of this picture and it's being made in one continuous piece. Up at the top, we have our lagging strand, which is being made in fragments. I've highlighted one of the Akazaki fragments here. And you can see that there's a gap between it and the rest of the DNA molecule towards its left. Fortunately, we have an enzyme whose entire job is to connect adjacent nucleotides in a single strand. That's DNA ligase. And so DNA ligase will catalyze the formation of phosphodiester bonds between the terminal nucleotides of adjacent Akazaki fragments, leading to the eventual synthesis of a continuous new lagging strand. We should pause here before we wrap up just to point out that these cartoon representations are simplified from what actually happens in cells. You can find highly detailed computer animations of how all of these enzymes work together in a cohesive unit on YouTube with relative ease. And you should definitely check them out because it's awesome to watch how all of these things work together to produce a new DNA molecule from a pre-existing DNA molecule. Thanks so much for watching this video on DNA replication. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. 
Make sure you can explain how the measles install experiment supports the semi-conservative model of DNA replication and refutes the conservative model and the dispersive model. Make sure that you can describe the roles of each enzyme that we discussed in this video and how they all function in the replosome to lead to the production of new DNA. Also make sure that you can contrast leading strand and lagging strand replication, how are they different, and be able to identify them in replication fork diagrams. And finally, make sure that you can determine the polarity of opposing DNA strands. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have and do what you need to do in order to get the answers to those questions. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a good day.